Hello and welcome to the CX Files for October 13th, 2022. My name is Mark Hillary and I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm Peter Ryan back in Montreal. Mark, great to be with you today. And we've got a really interesting discussion with, I would say, one of the most fascinating characters I've met in the CX space, David Powers, who is based in Los Angeles, California, and who is the CX Contact Center Manager for an organization called Ruder Hero. Now, Ruder Hero is a rapidly expanding network of plumbing professionals in the western part of the states. They've got they've got uh, deployments in California and Arizona, soon to be expanding into Nevada. And David has got an absolutely fascinating history and background when it comes to contact centers. Yeah, it's great that you got David on um, because I don't know David and we've never met, but I keep seeing, you know, his his little icon on LinkedIn. There's a lot of CX discussions that are going on on LinkedIn where I keep seeing um, David liking or commenting on it. So uh, when I heard that you got him on here, I thought that's great because, um, you know, it'd be great to actually get his background. And, and I heard that um, he had a massive BPO failure, didn't he, that, that yeah. he's been talking about. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things we're going to talk about on the pod today is the fact that when David got involved with Ruder Hero, uh, there was an initiative to work with an outsourcing provider. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go well. Uh, David explains that over the course of about a month or so, they ended up costing his company a significant amount of money and lost revenue, and they needed to decide what they were going to do. They pivoted, and they ended up building their own contact center from the ground up. A really interesting story. Uh, David's also got a few other things that we chat about. Number one, Mark, we'll hear from the outset. He is, a, like yourself, a published author. In fact, recently he published a book that you can find on Amazon called The Blue Collar Call Center, which discusses the opportunities and the challenges of running a CX operation designed around tradespeople. Uh, we talk also a little bit about his views on what the outsourcing community needs to do in order to be relevant and what, how they should best position their services if they're going to be pertinent to the buying community. So there's a lot to unpack here. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention as well that David has got his own podcast called Caffeinated CX. And I can tell you that he he indicated to us that while he's a big fan of the CX files, he was kicking himself when we took the name because he said that he's a massive X-Files fan and would have loved it. But I said to him, caffeinated CX has definitely got a nice ring to it. It's got a great advantage it, for a, a universe of podcasts out there. It's hard not to remember caffeinated CX, especially for yourself and myself. who are big coffee fans and you who live next to a coffee farm. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I can look out of my window right now and see fields of coffee. So, uh, yeah, it, it would definitely be appropriate. Maybe uh, maybe we should both get onto his podcast sometime. Well, if David will have us, I'm sure that we would be more than pleased to share our views. Uh, and I would say too, Mark, uh, David was a guest. He was a panelist at CX Outsourcers a few weeks ago in Las Vegas. And, and I think really did a great job bringing a, a new and different perspective from the buying side, from the enterprise side to the assembled guests. And, and a lot of the things that he talks about on the pod were elements that he brought to the table live at the CX Outsourcers meeting in the Fremont Street area. Yeah, and I think it's just great to have someone that's got that real coalface experience of, of really being in there, running a customer service team and having to make it work, um, whether it's being run in-house or having to work with uh, an outsourced partner. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's too many gurus in this, this sort of area um, who just talk about, here's some CX strategy or CX theory, um, but, but they've never actually had to sort of um, make the rubber meet the road, you know? Yeah, this is it. And for somebody, as you say, who's been at the coal face, for somebody who has been able to build an operation literally from scratch, he really brings, I think, a point of view that is extremely valuable, whether you're on the enterprise side and you're looking for some ideas and some inspiration or best practices, or if you're an outsourcer, understanding what the buyer is looking for. I also think that something David brought to the table over the course of our discussion is this idea about the fact that running a contact center designed around tradespeople 
and people who are supporting consumers who might be in a bit of a pickle or a bit of a jam when they're calling up is a very different idea than perhaps somebody who is supporting a consumer in the telco space or in retail banking and so forth. As David put, I think he's bang on. If you're calling up Bruder Hero, you're not calling up to have just a friendly chat. You're calling up because you've got a crisis and you need it dealt with very quickly. And the pressure that places on the agents and the supervisors all the way up through the management is, is tremendous. And as we go straight to the interview, I think that our listenership is going to get a lot out of this. All right. That's great. So let's go straight to this interview with David Powers. Well, this week, the CX Files is really fortunate to have a a true thought leader and equally, I think, is important, an author, which my co-host Mark Hillary will be very happy about, given the, the number of books he's written, as well as a fellow CX podcaster in the form of David Powers, who joins us from Los Angeles. David, thank you so much for taking some time. I know you're a a busy contact center manager amongst all the other roles that you play in life. Great to have you here. Oh, no, it's my pleasure to be here. I've been listening to the CX Files for for a few years now. And at first, I was kind of jealous that you guys got the name first, because I'm a big (laughs) X-Files fan. And it was like, oh, cool. So this is really an honor for me to be on. Well, the the honor is ours, my friend, and I can tell you that we actually connected several months ago, but we met for the first time a couple of weeks back at CX Outsourcers, where you very kindly participated in our buyers panel, which was the last session of the conference, and I think really one of the most compelling ones that we had, and and we're going to touch on that in a little bit over the course of our discussion. But first of all, David, could you talk to us a little bit about your role and what you do in the CX industry in your nine to five job? If we can even call it a nine to five job. I don't think anybody works nine to five in this space. No, no. my, my department's open 24 seven. So, so am I. So, but yeah, um, I run the contact center for Ruder Hero Plumbing among many other things here. Um, we're a 24 seven department, like I said, uh, we take all the inbound calls for the for our clients, which we service pretty much all of California, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and also some very soon places in Nevada as well. So we're expanding, we're fielding so many calls that sometimes it gets a little frustrating, but also very exciting. Um, and I had the opportunity to one a long time ago, watched the uh, the contact center kind of fizzle out and then got to rebuild it, which honestly was the highlight of my career and something that I really, really love doing. So I'm sure we'll get into that too. We will get into that. But I want to start first off, David, by chatting a little bit about Uh, your recently published book. And let me just say, I have actually ordered a copy and I'm waiting for it to arrive. I can't wait to, to dive into it. But the book is called The Blue Collar Call Center. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what prompted you to write the book and and what the the book's all about. Yeah, definitely. So what prompted me to write the book was I, other than a couple, I could not find a good call center book, right? They're either really, really skimpy in information or there's too much information and it reads like a textbook. Now, I don't like reading textbooks and I also like getting a lot of information. So I had to go ahead and because there weren't any others on the market except for a couple and I'll name drop uh, Thomas Laird's advice from a call center geek, right? That one, that one was actually entertaining. Yeah. Read. So, hey puppy. <laughs> so, nah, I have a dog too. Um, so, but that was the uh, one that was that one of the only ones I've read that was actually entertaining and interesting. And there wasn't, not, not only were there were not many good call center books, there were none for the trades, right? So I had to change that. The trades is something that I've been working in for over 10 years, just through Ruder Hero Plumbing, and there was nothing out there. So basically you had to go from scratch or to, kind of find out what other companies were doing with their call centers, right? 
and yeah. emulating that and not only not always successful. So everything in the book is what I've done since I took over the department after we rebuilt it. Got it. So a lot of tried and true things in there, like how to hire um, the training curriculum that goes into it, the KPIs. And the last part is about the culture. So in the culture that we've created. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Interesting. And from, from the standpoint of the, uh, of what's going on in the, the, the blue collar contact center or the tradesperson contact center, David, what do you see as the fundamental differences between running that type of a CX operation versus perhaps what we more would traditionally associate with things such as retail banking or telecommunications? Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. Because at first I was like, well, it does make us different, right? And there's, what, what I would boil it down to is how many different contact points there are for the customer to go through all the aspects of the service where the contact center is one aspect of it. The contact center is the first aspect that they usually reach after marketing. But the fact that we have to build the value, not only for the service, the customer, the technician that would go out there and do the service, um, but also the after parts too. Like, did anything go wrong? Let's do a, uh, let's do a call to see how we did while we're on the job and how, how we did on the phones, right? There's a lot of moving parts and all it is, is we have to build so much value that when the technician goes out there, the customer can't really say no, right? Because we built all that value for the technician to get out there, do their job, fix up whatever it is that they're dealing with. Um, all the customers that call in, other than a couple maintenance type things, are in a panic mode right? So empathy is incredibly important, maybe more important than other industries, right? Because people are dealing with things they've never dealt with before. They're seeing raw sewage coming up in their children's bathtub, right? As gross as that is, that's a very common call that we get. And there's certain ways of handling that call. And since our target demographic really is anybody with a toilet, from all walks of life. You're not getting just one segment of the population. You're getting, you're getting wealthy people, people who just rent, right? And since California, 43% of Los Angeles County own homes, that leaves the rest all rent. And in LA, most of the time, the tenant is responsible for any, any plumbing repairs, which whatever. Um, but we're dealing with people that are in a state of panic. From the time they call in until the time the technician leaves the house after they fixed it. So a lot of empathy and empathy doesn't come easily for a lot of people, right? Or at least expressing empathy, right? So it's not just a tone. It's not just a feeling. It's how you verbalize it, right? And we go deep in training on that. And that's what makes it different. Every customer that we get is agitated they're having one of the worst days of their life right and they need someone to fix their problem because it's a very tangible smelly dangerous sometimes even can lead to disease kind of issue so there you go and and I think, you know, as you mentioned at CX Outsourcers, people aren't phoning unless they've got a real problem. They're not phoning for a chat. It's like when you call your insurance company, odds are you're going to be in a panic. And, and that's really important. But that raises another question, David, the extent to which the agents need to not just interact potentially with the consumer, but also with the individual plumbers who form yes. part of the network. And, and what are some of the challenges that you've got to deal with there? A lot of the challenges are the CSRs, customer service agents, very, very, very emotionally intelligent, right? That's what we hire for. Um, technicians, plumbers are very analytical. You know, they're more logic. How do we get this done with the maximum amount of profit? Let's face it. Okay. Um, 
and very, very, very different personalities. Um, that and if you've ever uh, had service done in your home, sometimes it doesn't take place in that window they gave you, right? The technician gets sidetracked at another job or goes to a restaurant or something. So dealing with that, and we have many ways of doing it, one phone call, text, chat, all that stuff is really finding out how the technicians react to certain agents. Some technicians only talk to one agent that they built a great rapport for or with, right? So not only do we have to build rapport with the customer, we have to build rapport with everybody that's out in the field. So, and that's everybody from the people that have to dig up the holes to the people that do the repairs to the local office staff and everything like that. Okay, that, that's really interesting. And there's obviously a huge ecosystem that the agents have to get their heads around. And I'm sure that without the proper training and without the proper environment, it, it could lead to a lot of anxiety and could lead to a lot of turnover. So how do you address that? Well, um, first off, my turnover for the year so far is about 12%. So what we that's, do- That's is, phenomenal. That's just incredible. Thank you. Thank you. It was lower last year, but things happen. <laughs> so, but uh, what we do is we do a lot of training. So the initial training is about three weeks, which for a plumbing company, some people were like, wow, that's a long time for that. But a lot of it is inundating people with the culture, right? Preventing burnout from happening. I've been in call centers since I was 17 years old and I was tired of, uh, you know, being one of 20 people in a class that looks around three months later and you don't recognize anybody, right? I think uh, anybody who's worked in the call center space knows that feeling, right? So we do a lot of mindset training. We go over stoicism. We go over a lot of uh, just, if you're in this situation, do this before we even begin to touch the systems, right? Before we even begin to cover anything about plumbing or HVAC or anything like that. The majority of the first week is just dealing with mindset to prevent turnover, to prevent burnout, to prevent people snapping on each other because it's a stressful day. So we're a hybrid center. So a lot of people think that you can't have a good uh, company culture if you know, you're not all in the same room, you know, smelling the same stuff that Gary cooked in the microwave, right? We found the opposite. So we found that hybrid works for us and it works for the people that we hired and leading and creating a culture through Discord, we use Discord for our chat communications, is incredibly simple if you do it right. So, and we've gamified the entire thing, but yeah, our turnover is incredibly low. Um, sentiment is way up. And it's a, it's a good scene. Congratulations. Those numbers are really phenomenal, yeah. especially in today's labor market. And especially given some of the challenges, I think that, that you've indicated that <laughs> the, the callers are facing and the agents would face it at the same time. So well done. So David, let's talk a little bit about your experience setting up your own contact center. You talked a little bit about this at CX Outsourcers, but I'm certain that the listening audience will be fascinated to hear a little bit about what happened, what prompted it, and what are some of the key takeaways you gained from starting a contact center really from scratch? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what had happened is in a few years ago, we decided to outsource the center to save money for, you know, other things, right? And we uh, laid the majority of the, the then call center staff off other than like five people, right? Who were just going to take like, if someone didn't want to speak to someone in the outsource center, they could transfer them to one of the customer service reps here in the building. And from the time we flipped the switch, it went bad, right? So we flipped the switch. The calls were supposed to go right over there what the calls would do is go nowhere, right? That was the first initial run when, as soon as we hit go, right? And then we were like, oh no. So we diverted it back to the five people that we had left. They got way overwhelmed 
with calls because it was normal call volume. And we found out what was going on there. The internet to the building that they were outsourced to went out and it was going to be out for the next two days. So that was bad. Uh, we found out some other things that they didn't have enough stations for people, right? And they didn't uh, they didn't tell us that like three of the agents they hired had left, right? And that the internet in the area that they had was very, very spotty. And it was just a, a bad scene. In the end, we had to send one of our uh, leads over to that center and they were there for two weeks. But that did no good because as soon as they left, everything reverted back to what it was, right? So the people uh, were, th there was no supervision of the people in the building itself. It was just, they were in like, what looked to be on the cameras, just a closet with five stations, right? Yeah, right now we're, uh, we're running at about 32 people on the phones, and granted, call volume is a lot higher than it was many years ago, but not that low, right? You still need five more, five, more than five people on staff, right? And then people were being hung up on um, the accents, which were actually really, really good in the interview process. As soon as they started taking calls, native speakers of their language couldn't understand what they were saying. So stuff like that. And in the end, um, it cost us around six to 700 K in lost revenue. So <laughs> I went to the, to the owners, the C level. And I was like, this isn't working. We need to bring it back. And then I got some support from other people in the company and they were like, okay, cool. Um, higher up. Um, the only way that we're going to bring it back is if it becomes a world-class center, right? You have to make that commitment. You have to meet these KPI goals, everything else. So we started hiring. Uh, we had to hire quickly um, because we needed it gone. And within two weeks of, um, of making that decision, we started taking live calls back here in the States with brand new agents a couple of return agents and we slowly phased the outsource center out. And by slowly, I mean like a week. So that's slow for us. We're very, very fast paced here. And it was so bad that like a lot of customers when they would, we'd call them just to get a uh, kind of a temperature check on them because they hadn't used us in a while or, their appointment was canceled, stuff like that. They were like, yeah, I will never use you because of this scenario that went on. Very sad time. But since then, we've uh, expanded the contact center here. We've made it world-class. It's one of, if not the best trades call center in at least California. And that's, I might be a little biased on that, but I've compared numbers. And our numbers are far, far superior, especially in conversion rate for book leads and as well as turnover. So we had to do everything from scratch and it was really, really, really fun. So it, it sounds like a labor of love. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes these things can come out of a, a bad situation or a, a gloomy, cloudy uh, uh, scenario. But but you really, I think, have been able to find that silver lining, David, and well done on that front. So final question for you. You, as I mentioned, participated at CX Outsourcers on the Enterprise Leaders Panel, where you were addressing questions from the assembled gathering of individuals from the BPO community. Would you share with us a little bit about what you think the outsourcing community needs to do in order to be relevant to organizations like your own and to executives like yourself? Right. No, definitely. So the first one is to really provide value, right? Provide an ROI and have numbers ready. So how much do you charge in this situation? Everything like that. So the other is full transparency, right? We need to know 
what the company is, what the culture is like on the, on the outsource call floor, right? Is there a good culture? What's the turnover rate, right? How many people are really going to have to pay for training, right? Or how, or how many new recruits are we going to get every couple of weeks, right? That's not going to remember the script. That's not going to remember all the areas that we service. That's going to mix zip codes up together, right? Um, Another thing that we, it's hard, it's like pulling teeth with a lot of companies, but that's to get referrals from clients that they're already servicing, right? Honest reviews of service, or even just a sit down conversation with another user, right? That's gold right there. Especially if you have a happy client, you want them to be talking to potential clients, right? I don't know why it's like pulling teeth, but it's not, it's pretty much every industry that's like that. And the, the last one is tell us the truth. Don't lie to us. Don't say everything's golden when it's not. So that's the issue that we ran into when we tried it was the constant lying, right? The constant gaslighting or trying to cover something up. And that's what ruined it was the lies. And usually I'm not that blunt. Yeah, okay. Yes, I am. But it was 100% falsehood of what we were presented and what we got at the end. So don't lie to the potential customer. I think that's very sage advice. And, and quite frankly, it's a basic that nobody should get wrong, but it sounds as if uh, the experience you're talking about um Th this is something that I think everybody in the BPO community needs to take to heart. So thank you very much, David. Before we go, two last final, very straightforward questions for you. Number one, where can listeners who are interested find your podcast? Well, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple. It's on a few of the other ones, but those are the two major ones. It's okay. just Caffeinated CX. So it's fun. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I, you know, you, you were talking a little bit about the CX files name. I think caffeinated CX is, is, is up there too. So you've done well on that front. Second thing, where can interested parties buy your book? All right. It's on Amazon. Um, it's $5 for the paperback and $3 for the Kindle. I think I'm overcharging on the Kindle. I think I can make it free. Um, it's not to make a profit or anything. It's to get the word out and to potentially help other call centers in the trades. So it's my labor of love. It's my way of giving back to the industry that one, I absolutely love. And two, this might be a conversation over a beer some other time, but call center work in the trades is what brought me out of homelessness when I was younger. So it's my way of giving back to the industry. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that you've teed up another potential podcast. David, it's rare that we find people with such a passion for the CX space and for the contact center industry. It's a sector that I have been working in now for 20 years in my own humble way. And I, I think that in the broader end of society, it gets a bit of a bad rap, but it's stories like yours that really, I think, give it the credence and the gravitas it deserves. So thank you so much. Cannot wait to see you back live at another event soon. And certainly can't wait for our next chat on uh, the CX files. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you for having me on. It was awesome. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week. Cool. Not Austin Powers, but David Powers. <laughs>